Who wants to stay next to a radioactive melting isotope core? Hello everybody and welcome back to part three out of three of the science curriculum for the World Scholars Cup 2020 curriculum. Did I just say curriculum two times in a sentence? Video, uh, we're gonna be looking at the end of the world. Um, specifically what we would do if there was a massive flood. Shout out again to Kevin uh, for video editing um, this video. I greatly appreciate his work. So you can check out his YouTube channel and his Instagram in the links down below. And let's get right into the content. Okay, first up is the impending doom of flooded cities, which will affect over 150 million people globally. A few of the cities that will be flooded include Shanghai, Mumbai, Bangkok, and will affect three times more people than scientists initially thought by the year 2050. Be careful as these people are would actually be called climate migrants, not climate refugees. A few reasons why is that migration is not necessarily forced while being a refugee is. And climate migration is internal, meaning that it happens inside the country as these people aren't necessarily moving to other countries and don't often require international aid from a third party, which is why these people are climate migrants, not climate refugees. Anyways, back to the flooding problem, because flooding cities is not only a problem for the environment, as a lot of pollutants are thrown into the ocean, but also for a country as it worsens its economy. As global temperature rise, um, the Arctic and Antarctic ice melts, which increases the total amount of water inside the ocean as well as the fact that water naturally tends to expand when heated up. This should be alarming considering that there are 1.34 times 10 to the 21 liters of water in the ocean, which means that you need a lot of ice to melt in order to increase the ocean levels to a substantial amount that it would flood major cities. But rising oceans is not the only reason why uh, oceans why cities may flood. Another condition called land subsidence may also explain um, some of the flooding. This is when water is pumped out from below the city or, or near the city to a point where there's significant space between the rocks and the soil that it kind of collapses onto each other, which decreases the altitude of the city. Okay, now onto this dam in the Netherlands. Um, this is what it's called. I'm not gonna try to pronounce it because I tried recently and Kevin, as, as you've seen it, it's not, it's not being nice. I, I'm terrible with pronouncing these names. Absolutely terrible. Now onto this dam um, called Aflidike. Af Af okay, this is technically a dam because it separates water from water. It was built almost 90 years ago with the intention of shutting the bay from the North Sea. They built it by dumping sand, wrong, rock, and dirt uh, making it thick enough uh, to build a motorway on it. They are upgrading the dam uh, by 2023 due to rising sea levels uh, and increased severity in storms. This upgrade is done by adding 75,000 blocks uh, called level blocks, which are the star shaped rocks with holes in them, which you can see right here. These blocks require less concrete and fit more efficiently together. They are testing this design uh, by creating massive waves that supposedly only occur once every 10,000 years to make sure that the design can withstand even the harshest of weathers. Okay, in November 2019, Venice started flooding. The reason for this is because of a political scandal around their own dam building project called MOSE. This structure would only help the city and protect it for around 30 years, which would be enough time to build an even more sophisticated structure around Venice. But Venice is sinking at a rate of half a centimeter a year because of the water pumping under the city that occurred before and uh, a little bit of tectonic plates activity. Okay, another city is one in Alaska uh, called Kivalina, which is predicted to be fully flooded in approximately five years. The US Army built a small dam around the city as temporary support, but the First Nations are suffering in the area uh, because they use the ocean as their main source of food and thinner ice means that it's harder for them to carry their canoes across the ice to fishing locations. Okay, now on to cities that adjust the environment for their own uh, purpose. One of the main players that have done this is America, as you'll see in the article in the WC website. A few reasons why America has done this uh, is because of the increase in housing, uh, the increase in tech companies, and the diversity that America has experienced, specifically with that of sports. As you can see here, 
um, a soccer field was actually changed for a cricket one. Okay, now on to Singapore, whose landmass has increased approximately 25% uh, in the past 200 years. This is because of land reclamation, which is when you dump soil and sand and rock into the ocean uh, to expand uh, the, the land area of your country to accommodate more people. This is also happening across Asia, specifically in Penang, uh, Malaysia, uh, where they're expanding the land to accommodate for luxury hotels, trading ports, and increased living quarters. This has a significant effect on the local fishing environment as almost zero fish are now being caught by local fishermen in the area who depend on the ocean uh, for their business. Okay, now one possible solution to prevent species extinction is to create these corridors that allow species uh, to migrate up north or to places where the biome is suitable uh, for them to live. These corridors specifically move animals north, uh, that way they can stay in cooler environments, such as the grizzly and black bear here in British Columbia. These corridors are when the ecology of the biomes are the same for long periods of time, which means that the animals can just keep walking without feeling like they're in another biome. These are usually connected by rivers and contain many of the same plant life and species that animals would normally expect to see in their biome. Okay, now on to Dubai's effort to become a green, the greenest city uh, by 2050, as it currently has the largest environmental impact of any city uh, across the world. So how do they plan to make this ambitious leap? Uh, simply because Dubai has the most renewable source of energy solar panels. Buildings are also being optimized to conserve as much energy as possible. This includes reflective windows, extra insulation, uh, specifically for heating water, and efficient LED light bulbs. Okay, now on to underwater cities. While the technology is available to create underwater cities, it still has not been done. So why are we not living underwater, you may ask? Okay, one of the main problems with living underwater is that you can't really collect or retain energy as you would, let's say, on the surface. You can't really burn coal or set up solar panels down there or even like harness wind, which are main sources of energy that we use here on Earth. Some people might argue that you can have a nuclear power plant in your underwater city, but Come on, who 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 wants to be who wants to stay next to a radioactive melting isotope core? Building below 300 meters is also a problem uh, because of the pressure. Simply because being exposed to pressure uh, for long periods of time leads to long-term nerve damage. But the bigger problem is that we would eventually run out of breathable oxygen. Also, the fact that we need sunlight to grow crops and eat food. And while crops can be grown uh, with a little amount of sunlight, uh, still the entire structure would require a lot of outside funding and resources uh, to maintain sustainable. In the US, flooding on the edge of the country on the shorelines are forcing citizens to reallocate themselves throughout the country. The two main reasons of increased sea level is because of the melting of ice in the Arctic and Antarctic and because uh, water naturally tends to expand when heated up. All in all, water levels are increasing at a linear rate uh, throughout the US, but in some areas, it's actually accelerating. Okay, now on to the last few case studies. If Earth had a single biome, what would it be? This is a very interesting question, as almost all planets in science fiction are, consist of only one biome. These science fiction writers often don't take into to consideration the wide variety of creative biomes that they could use for their fictional worlds, simply because using biomes that are prominent in Earth keeps the planet simple in a way that's understandable for the masses. If Earth had one biome, I think that biome would be the taiga, or also known as the boreal forest, which is the most prominent biome on Earth. Okay, now onto something called carrying capacity which is how many people uh, Earth can hold before all the people use up all its resources and, e and essentially just die. The carrying capacity of Earth is approximately 10 billion with our current technology, which as you can see on this graph, um, this population of the Earth will reach approximately 10 billion by the year 2050, which means that I'll be approximately 47 years of age when the apocalypse reaches. Yay. Okay, how to solve population growth to a place where it's sustainable 
uh, one of the main things society can do is to actually educate women because it has been shown and studied that educated women tend to have smaller family and more knowledge on employment opportunities and on birth control. The ideal earth population would be around 2 billion because this would be the population at which the resources are used efficiently, where everyone gets enough and people yet live happy and productive lives. Okay, next up is expanding the constraints of the biosphere. This is the amount of resources the earth has to satisfy everyone on it. E.O. Wilson expanded on this and compared it with an economist uh, to an environmentalist. He stated that the economy is the best it's ever been in the history of humanity, yet humans have built it in a way where it's relying on Earth as if it was a paradise with an infinite amount of resources, which it's not. Eventually, we're going to run at a stage where we don't have any more resources to sustain the economic development we're experiencing right now. And by that point, it'll be disaster. The environmentalist argues that we need to effectively use these resources to save the planet. As you can see, there's a little bit of debate between the environments and economists simply because if we were to reduce the amount of resources we use, the economy wouldn't thrive as much as it's thriving right now, which is a very interesting argument because not both sides can be completely happy. But trust me, if you want to survive and, you know, live happy long lives, we need to sort of start listening more to the environmentalists or else we won't have an earth and there won't be an economy to live on. Okay, now on to astronaut mining. Okay, listen, the wealth gap you see today with billionaires um, is absolutely nothing compared to the massive wealth, gra wealth gap that is going to happen once multi-trillionaires become profitable off mining asteroids. There are many pros to mining asteroids, uh, one, of, one of which is that the minerals found in asteroids uh, can be used to repay a lot of the debt the economy around economies around the world have. And it's one of the only ways which in which we're going to build very efficient space solar panels. Next up is the eco modernist uh, movement, which is a movement where people believe that economic growth, technological advancements and uh, a clean and sustainable environment are all possible at the same time. What they plan to do is to eradicate coal, uh, focus on renewable energy efficiency, uh, on nuclear power, as well as protecting uh, wildlife, uh, creating clean drinking water, and using GMOs to, to remove hunger from around the world as part of their manifesto. A big problem many point to uh, with these solutions is called the Jevons Paradox, which is not specifically stated in the World Scholars Cup curriculum, but it really helps you if you're in a debate against a geoengineering um, topic. This paradox states that the more efficient something comes, uh, the more people are incentivized uh, to consume more of it, which answers the question on whether these people are too optimistic, uh, because according to this paradox, the world isn't actually getting greener every year. It might appear that way because technology is getting more advanced and technology is becoming more renewable, cleaner, more efficient, yet people start consuming more. So you can use this for a rebuttal if you're debating against global warming solutions, for example. Okay, next is this interesting novel on the future of New York City uh, in the year 2140. Of course, this is just a novel, but it presents some interesting ideas on how humans uh, will have to adapt to the changing climate. Basically, New York City has flooded due to rising sea levels, and it's basically turned into the new Venice of the modern world. People are now going around their daily lives on bridges, boats, and just traveling around uh, doing their normal day-to-day -day work. A major lesson this novel teaches us is that humans simply can recognize how their short-term actions result on a geological scale. And that now we're starting to reap the consequences and that they're, the characters in the novel are trying to make their world better in their own way. Okay, finally is probably the most ambitious way to deal with global warming. And I guess it would work. Okay, basically we get the planet and we move it to an orbit farther away from the sun because the farther the earth is away from the sun, the less sunlight hits the face of the earth. How to do this would involve us using one of these following methods. The first is to, cr to create a massive ion drive that shoots charged particles in the opposite of earth's orbit. This would have to be built 1000 kilometers away from sea levels to be effective. Uh, so basically we have to just build this massive 
thruster and shoot a beam off it in the opposite direction. We could also create a massive solar sail, uh, similar to what Bill Nye proposed uh, in Science 2. We would need one the size of 19 Earth diameters uh, to create enough thrust to actually throw Earth into a farther orbit. We can also get a small gravity assist that would be enough to pull us into a smaller orbit. And by small, I mean getting small asteroids, swinging them around the Earth and using their small gravity to push Earth a little bit. And we just need a few of these, um, no more than like a million. Okay, and finally the Scholar's Cup asks, if you could ignore the laws of physics, what would you do? Well, I'm glad you asked, Daniel, because I have multiple hypotheses if I could manipulate physics to whatever I wanted. That probably sounded extremely cringe. Okay, the first thing I would do would be to create a perpetual motion machine that would generate infinite energy. To create infinite energy, I would have to basically ignore all of the laws of thermodynamics. And then what I would do is I'd go out, somehow find six infinity stones, snap my fingers, and trick myself into thinking that I help humanity, when in reality I just wiped out half of the resources. So yeah, that's what I would do if I could control physics. Damn, I wish I could. Anyways, that's the end of the science curriculum for the 2020 World Scholars Cup curriculum, a world renewed. Thank you very much for watching this video. Shout out to Kevin uh, Fernando for editing this. You can check out his YouTube channel in the links down below. Go subscribe, go support him. He's an amazing creator. He makes a few uh, videos. Amazing guy, go follow him down below. And if you found this video helpful, please, please do me a big favor and share it with your friends, share it with your delegation, show it to your teacher, to your mom, to your dog, I don't care, share it around, make sure more, more people are prepared for the World Scholars Cup, especially your teammates. That's it for this video, I hope you enjoyed, and until next time, stay productive. I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.